So thank you. Um, as you mentioned, um, I do a lot of work in both healthcare and education. Um, most of my research is very applied. Um, I look. I like to work with community partners. I like to do things out in the environment um, and so on. So um, happy to talk about healthcare stuff if anybody's interested some other time or later on after the seminar today. Um, but today we're going to focus on some of the education work because our awesome Surfit student, Rachel, um, is working on one of our education projects this summer. So that was a good opportunity to sort of talk about some of the things that we're doing in that space. Um, you probably already learned most of what you would ever want to know about me, um, but I will tell you right now that I'm not on Facebook, so I'll tell you what pictures you would see on Facebook um, if I were. Um, I'm particularly, in my personal life as well as some of the things I do professionally, very devoted to um, working on autism and, and cancer issues. Um, I'm a huge Red Sox fan. I don't care that you're all Angels fans. It's fine. Um, <laughs> this is my niece, who I you know, like to slip into, uh, into presentations as much as possible. I'm sure she'll soon be replaced by this guy. Um, <laughs> but for now, she's much cuter than he is. Um, my dog, she has a blog. Um, extra points to anyone who can find her blog, who hasn't already. Grad students in the back. I know that you've already found it. Um, and then my husband, Steve, of course. Um, OK, so. I mentioned I was going to talk about education a little bit today. This might be um, some of the kinds of things that you think of when you think about elementary school education, right? Um, this is actually a classroom in Kuwait, but it probably doesn't look that different from what many of you have seen in American um, you know, young classrooms. This is what educational technology tends to look like in people's minds. If I asked you what do you think of when you think about uh, technologies in schools, you're probably going to immediately go to this kind of vision, computer labs, um, those kinds of things. These are a little bit outdated. You can see Tuck, the Linux guy. That's why I like this particular picture because he's so cute. Um, but you've got some old CRT monitors. Some schools have upgraded from this. Some have not. Um, this is still what it looks like in some places. But that being said, um, this is also education. Um, so these are kids out doing a science field trip. These pictures are all from Flickr, by the way. Um, this is from Old Shoe Woman's photo stream, and it talks about third graders on a field trip to an agricultural center. Um, and they're also doing educational activities. And along those lines, then, you see things like the Butterfly Net project that comes out of Stanford. Um, where they were looking at supporting those kinds of field trip activities for biology classes for students. And what does it mean to do educational technology in this space? It looks very, very different um, than the kinds of educational technologies we think of when I show you the lab pictures. Um, also, education doesn't always look like that classroom that I showed you in the beginning, right? So this is also education. Um, this, these are kids with autism doing one-on-one -on -one instruction and doing a lot of hand-over-hand -hand kind of interactions. Um, very intense with their aides um, and teachers sitting right with them. And this is also educational technology. So we talk about these. These are assistive devices to help kids who may not be verbal and able to communicate to be able to do so. Um, and this is also educational technology. So I just want to kind of set that stage for you guys to say, um, we, one of the things that's really compelling about ubiquitous computing is that we have devices all the way from microscopic things all the way up to huge um, you know, wall-sized displays that we can deploy into these different technological, into these different educational environments, which gives us this amazing opportunity to ask, how can technology really help this particular kind of learning? There's lots of kinds of learning. For this particular kind of student, and we can do a lot of more individualized education and so on, um, within this type of educational structure, um, and there's a lot of different ones, and different teachers have different pedagogical approaches, and it's really important to acknowledge those, um, and in this environment, whether it's a public school, a private school, clinical, et cetera. So that's sort of your basic overview of what I um, hope that you'll take away from this today. Um, if you read the abstract, and I don't blame you if you didn't, it's a busy summer, you'll know that I'm going to talk about a few things in the autism space, um, and then some general education stuff, and then talk a little bit about using UbiComp type technologies to actually teach kids about computer science and engineering. So you're going to see some different stuff. It's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, it's OK. You can stop me and ask questions. And if I have to skip things later, then that's what we'll do. We'll make sure we still get you out of here on time, hopefully. OK. So the first project I want to talk about is a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in special education classrooms um, to work on 
some of the things that kids with autism are using in the classrooms currently. So you have a practice in most special ed classrooms of using visual artifacts to help support kids. And one example of these are visual schedules. So you'll see on the board, this probably, has anybody seen anything like this, either in a regular ed classroom or special ed? I see some nodding, okay. Um, so you'll see things like calendars to tell you when special dates are coming up, or here you see a much more specific kind of schedule, and these are what um, they'll use in special education, where each stripe here is an, a different student. And what they have are cards that are laminated and then Velcroed to that board so that I know if I'm red, I can go up and see, okay, what am I supposed to do next? Take my card off, go prepare for that activity. And this really helps kids to sort of feel secure in their environment, to know this is gonna happen now and then this later thing is gonna happen, especially for kids who may have trouble sequencing events in their minds that way. Um, and it allows them to be a lot more independent, so I can go and check my schedule as opposed to having to be led hand by hand by a teacher from activity to activity, which of course we think builds some self-esteem and things like that. That being said, they're kind of a nightmare to create and maintain. Anybody have any teachers in the family? Okay, a few. How, much, how many hours have you spent helping that person laminate things? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> many. <laughs> um, that's unfortunately what happens, right? In classrooms, we have to create these things that you take a long time of cutting everything out, making it the right size, laminating it, sticking that Velcro on the back, and then when a kid develops and no longer needs that particular tool and maybe needs a different one, you have to start the whole process all over again. Or if something happens that day in the classroom that throws your schedule off, you have to completely redo everything. So that's really hard. So we thought, hooray, we can fix this. Computers, yay. Um, and you'll see a huge cast of characters here, including Meg, who's hiding in the way back, um, who've been working on this project now for about three and a half years. We've been um, in and out of a school in Fullerton during that time, creating a system to actually help sort of create easier interactions, um, do some of that progressive skill scaffolding to so make it easier to swap materials in and out, because now it's digitized. Um, and then I have a secret passion for record keeping in the sort of category of those who can't do research. Um, I'm terrible at managing my own records, so I'm obsessed with understanding how other people do it. Um, and we wanted to sort of do some of the record keeping that's required of schools in the background so that instead of it's somebody walking around and trying to actually monitor what kind of activities the kids are doing, now we do it automatically through the system. So let me just walk you through this really quickly. Um, the basic idea here is, and the reason they circled this is because it's not super clear in the picture. Um, each student has an individual device. This is about the size of an iPad, although we were using little Windows devices because this is before the iPads existed. Um, and then at the, set, at the front of the screen, uh, classroom, there's a large screen, and those are sort of all networked together. So we might say, okay, it's time for individual work, and you can see that that's what's been displayed on the big device. And then on each student's individual device, they'll get informed that it's time for individual work, possibly get a prompt about what their specific individual <coughs> work that they might need to be going and doing is. And this basically takes the place of the old paper-based mechanisms they were using for these kids who are largely not able to speak. Um, this shows you what the whole calendar looks like. So again, you see the stripes where each individual student has <coughs> their activities laid out. You'll notice that all of the activities are exactly the same in this picture. The system actually allows for those activities to vary, but in practice, um, most of the teachers didn't vary them very often. So it does happen from time to time. If you have a student who needs to get pulled out to go to speech or something, you might see something different. Um, also up at the top, the um, status bars of being green or white is how far along the student is in their particular activity that they might be working on now. So if we're doing some prompting on the device that the student's responding to, the teacher can monitor whether they finished or not, and they might say, okay, that student needs some extra help, and they can go over and give them some extra help. There's also stars up there that you probably can't see very well because this uh, classroom was using a token-based reward system, which kind of gets us to this. This is what the individual student's device looks like. They can get prompted with up to six options for any given thing, so I might say, what day of the week is it? And they get six options, and they're supposed to choose the right one. In this particular case, Irene was choosing her reinforcer for the day, so this is a part of the token-based economy that already existed in the school. So if you get five stars, then you get to have your thing, whatever that might be. It might be gummy bears, or in Irene's case, she really, really loved playing with hand sanitizer, so that's what she's chosen, and then you can see it sort of displayed here to continue to motivate her as this stuff swaps out. Um, 
After they get something right, they get an animation, sorry that's not very clear, um, fireworks, a train engine going by, whatever might be particularly motivating for that student. Um, and then we let the teachers do some of this record keeping that I was talking about in the background there. Um, okay, so better that you should hear how this went from one of our teachers directly, assuming that I can actually get this to play. My name is Arnie Morales, and I am the special day class teacher for kids with autism. Uh, uh, I teach kids that are fourth or sixth grade, but currently in the summertime, I have kids that range from second to fourth grade. And I think it's been amazing, um, you know, definitely if, um, haven't had to worry about setting up the schedules every single day uh, through this process. It was very time consuming. I think the kids are really, really uh, just learning with it, you know, and, and like, you know, being able to teach geography or concepts like more or less, you know, stuff that I, was, I wasn't able to appeal to them, you know, um, through other methods and, and through the Visca, I've been able to, you know, make, a, make it picture friendly and make it very visual for them to really uh, understand. I think that's going to be the big change is that they're going to be able to learn so many new concepts and stuff through this device. So that gives you um, a basic idea. There's a slightly longer version of that video up on the ICS website um, that Bobby Farmer was nice enough to put together for us. Um, but that's something that we've been working on now for a few years. The reason I want to point out that we've been doing it for a few years is because that's part of the way that I work. Um, and Rachel can tell you more about it when I'm not around, I'm sure, as to the, both the, the opportunities and challenges, let's say, of working in that way. We've spent a lot of time going back and forth working with Karina as a design partner with us to really understand the needs of her classroom, pulling in another classroom in her same school, doing things like that so that it's really very much a partnership. Um, as part of this work, we also started to really think about the ways in which the sort of individualized educational approach is still happening within a group classroom setting. And this became a really compelling thing for us to think about. Um, and Meg Kramer, who's a PhD student, decided, okay, well, let's um, look at regular ed um, and do this sort of idea of classroom-based design. So really thinking about an entire classroom as opposed to just an individual student working with an educational technology like you might see in sort of a one laptop per child kind of model. Um, and we were lucky enough to have Martin come and visit us from Germany. He's also in the back. Um, Matt is a student over in sociology, and then Rachel is with us for the summer. Um, so what we've been doing now is working with teachers <laughs> in both public and private schools, all in Costa Mesa, um, to sort of understand, for one, how does the technology even show up in the classrooms in the first place? Um, because there's some different mechanisms, different than you might think, as to how they, they show up. Anybody have any idea as to how a teacher might get a smart board in their classroom? They might write a grant. Other ideas? Come on, don't be shy. Parent donations. <laughs> Parent donations do happen from time to time. We see that mostly in the um, in the autism classrooms, actually, where where assistive technologies will just sort of show up one day because a parent read something um, that says this is good, and here they are. Uh, <laughs> other ideas? Any students have any ideas? Come on. Build one. Um, that would be awesome, but I've never seen it. <laughs> but I love that idea. And that's, in fact, some of what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get teachers in. Probably the most common way that I see teachers tell me that equipment shows up is that sometime around June 28th, um, the fiscal year for the school is ending up, uh -huh. and someone has said, hey, we have an extra $10,000. Do you want a smart board? Um, <laughs> And there's very little teacher preparation for what am I going to do with this? What is this thing you've just, I mean, a smart board, at least everybody kind of knows what that is, but lots of things show up that no one's ever heard of. Um, and so we're trying to understand sort of what that process is and how we can encourage it a little bit to ha happen in a way that might be more productive. Um, but also, what does it mean to then think about the technology at a whole classroom level as opposed to at an individual student level or a task level? So you'll often see specialized software come out for teaching math, for example, um, but it may not be integrated in, into the entire classroom approach. Um, and then, of course, we want to create new technologies. And what we're really finding in some of our early work is the sort of awareness of what's going on in student reflection on what they're, on what they're actually doing and their, and their thinking processes going through all of their lessons is what's going to be really important for us to, to do. Um, we're mostly focused on grades three through six, um, and that's 
and they're all regular education classrooms. So for the last, I guess, five months or so, Meg and Matt um, and Martin as well have been spending lots of time in these classrooms. So they spend, you know, a few hours at a time uh, observing what's going on in the classrooms. Here's some examples from some of the classrooms they've visited. Um, they've also done um, a bunch of interviews with people, um, about 10 interviews, about an hour each, just trying to understand what's going on in this space. Building on that, we then invited a bunch of these teachers to come and we had our most recent workshop yesterday. And um, so we're doing a series of workshops over the summer and this is what Rachel's been helping us out with a lot. Um, where we're really getting the teachers to do design. So David, great idea of having teachers be able to build things. They might not have the technical um, background to actually build the things themselves, but they make really great designers actually. Um, so they come in um, and work through different scenarios, draw things out for us, act things out for us, do a bunch of different things so we can kind of try to get an understanding of what it might look like to create a um, tool for reflection um, and sharing of data um, and so on in the classroom. So the main goals based on both our field work and in what we've been seeing in the design workshop so far are to encourage reflection. Um, so you guys are probably doing some reflection, I think, over the course of the summer, maybe. You're probably talking about what you're learning in your project. You might be even writing a report. Um, so some of this is about how do you do that with a fourth grader? Um, how do you get them to reflect on the process? Encouraging them to actually talk in pairs and not sort of giggle and talk about what's going on in the playground, but really to talk about what they're doing in their work and possibly sharing artifacts through the technology. Allowing teachers to monitor what everyone's doing and quickly check on how their progress is. So a lot like what we saw in the VSCED system and there are other classroom management systems already in existence that allow for this. Um, also communicating with parents and displaying the work. So there's a new focus, or at least new since I was in grade school, maybe not new since you guys were, um, on creating these sort of year-end portfolios and sharing this um, with parents and really having this kind of um, long-term view of what have you been learning. And so we're really trying to build that into the system so that can happen automatically. It doesn't require a ton of extra work on the part of both the students and the teachers to run around gathering materials at the end of the year and things like that. Um, so that's where we're at now. Hopefully by the end of the summer we'll have some nice designs and maybe even a system built that we can deploy next year with, uh, with some of the teachers that we've been working with. Um, well that gives you an idea of what Rachel's going to be doing. So we know based on lots of literature, <laughs> based on what I've been doing for the last several years, that we can use UVCOMP technologies to support education. Um, but we're also interested in trying to understand how can we use these kinds of technologies to teach kids about the technology itself. Um, because everybody is encountering these devices and of course some of the challenges that we see in this world are that people are not necessarily like you guys are. You guys are pretty IT savvy, I think. Here you wouldn't be here. Um, but there's lots of folks who aren't and so it's really important to build this sort of technology literacy and demystify some of the scariness that exists with technologies. Um, particularly for girls and other sort of underrepresented um, kids. So a project that we did for the last couple of years, um, it's actually wrapped up now, but, um, but it's kind of fun, um, was this idea of encouraging girls to be really creative through IT, and then so we sort of sneak computer science in on them, um, and they don't even know they're doing it until it's too late. Um, <laughs> and so another big cast of characters, you can tell I work with a lot of other folks, um, and we worked with Girls Inc. To, to do these workshops as part of their summer programs. And the idea here was that people like to tinker, right? And, and they say this a lot in the literature that boys especially like to tinker. And that's what helps boys to become good engineers, or this is so, so the hypothesis goes. Um, we think girls like to tinker too, they just like to do it often in a slightly different way. Um, so girls may be doing crafts projects and they may be building things in a slightly different way than you might see the boys who are like taking apart their remote controlled toy guns or cars or whatever they have. Um, so we wanted to really capitalize on this idea of hacking. Of, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do, just throw it together and we'll make it work. Um, and that way we can sort of take some of the fear out of having to do everything just so. So we had a four week summer camp that was really focused on creative technological design and a sort of problem based construction oriented approach. Um, and you can see some of the girls taking place in this. 
And um, we had 53 students in that project. 30 of them self-identified as Hispanic. They were all middle schools. They were about 11 to 14 years old. Um, and what we did was we had them two days a week in, three, in a one hour class in three groups. So there was basically 20 students in each and we were there for three hours, essentially every Tuesday and Thursday. We used a kit of things called the Pico Crickets. Anybody ever heard of them? All right, well I have a huge pile of them in my office. So if after this you really want to use them, you can come and visit um, anytime. Pico Crickets are really cool. They're these kits. Um, they're great for Kids, I probably wouldn't give them to anybody under maybe seven or eight, but if any of you have kids or grandkids at home or younger brothers and sisters, they're great for anybody over that age. Um, and they essentially come with a variety of different devices. So they might have little actuators and they have sensors and they'll light up and they'll do different things. Um, and some very simple drag and drop programming that looks like puzzle pieces. And then they often come with Legos and crafts and they're designed to be used in a sort of hybrid, physical, digital kind of space like this one. So we used the Pico Crickets, and what we had the girls do is we had them play engineer. Um, they actually had to wear these buttons. One says civil engineer, one electrical, one software, and we made up a category called design engineer because designer didn't fit with all of our other engineers. Um, <laughs> but essentially, that person was a designer. And what they did is they're in groups of four, and each class they rotate through. So you can't have the same button today that you had two days ago. Um, and since we had them for four weeks, each of them got to play that role twice. Um, and the civil engineer is in charge of all the Legos, right? So they have to make sure the structure of whatever you're doing on that particular day works. And the electrical engineer is in charge of all the devices, so plugging all the wires together, making sure everything's turned on, all the actuators are turning, all of that kind of stuff. The software engineer is, gets, the, gets the netbook and gets to do the drag and drop programming, and then the designer was in charge of all of the Play-Doh and the, um, you know, glue and pipe cleaners and everything else that we had. And what we saw is that if we can, or what we thought we'd see, and it turned out we did, um, is that if children are role playing about the world anyway, we know that, you play nurse, you play doctor, you play teacher, um, why not play engineer? Um, and so, that we try this, and then we reinforced it using a career panel here. We had them one day on campus for the full day, um, and had them doing a bunch of demos. Um, lucky enough to con many of my colleagues into having their students come and give demos. And the girls also created posters where they got to vote on which, which role was their favorite and they would talk about why and why they thought that was a good career path for them. Um, we also incorporated uh, multi-level mentoring kinds of things in here. It's very popular in the literature to say, okay, let's have, um, I had undergraduate students sort of running the workshops and they were mentoring high school students who were helping support the middle school girls. Um, so we had a bunch of different ages and I was definitely the old woman um, who kind of came around from time to time. Nothing makes you feel old like working with a ton of high school students and middle school students. Um, but in this way, everybody sort of felt like they had support at a level just up the next thing. But we also saw that the undergraduate students were more compelled about STEM stuff after mentoring the high school students and likewise the high school students talked about being more likely to declare engineering type majors in college after mentoring the middle school students which is predicted from the literature that people get more excited about stuff if they've mentored someone younger than them yeah yeah for like the students how did you, did you choose which students to like put this program on did you um like go to a middle school and have all the students take the class or Oh, that's a great question. So the middle school, middle school students were all from a Girls Inc. summer camp, which is um, mostly um, under-resourced girls, um, because it's a very low cost um, day camp. The high school students we got through a program that we've been doing here um, for a while. I actually don't run the program, but um, it works with the, the Brea Olinda is the high school, and they have a global IT academy. So these are students that have self-identified as interested in IT stuff and they do various things with us throughout the year. Um, and so this was an additional opportunity they could have for the summer, it was just a volunteer thing. Um, and then the undergrads was um, thanks to UROP actually. <laughs> so I had a, a couple of informatics students who were interested in doing it and they did a, um, a UROP uh, project on it. So like a lot of the students were like already interested in like the engineering? Yeah, so not the middle school girls, but the oh, high yeah, school definitely. students and the undergrads. Um, and and that was, that was purposeful. <laughs> we wanted people who were already interested right. in it. 
Um, but what we saw was um, even still their, their scores about their attitudes went even more up. Um, so it sort of reinforced their interest. That's a great question. Um, okay, additionally, we saw that there's a lot of these kinds of summer camps, people don't necessarily address the issue of the family. Um, and for Hispanic populations, this is particularly important. And um, so at the end of Girls Inc., they do a lot of other stuff. It's not just IT stuff. They do dance and they do all kinds of things throughout the year. And they have a huge celebration at the end of the summer camp every year. And it is packed. I mean, for 60 girls to be in summer camp, you'd expect what, maybe maybe two parents, maybe a third relative at the most, so you're up to 180 people. They would have like 400 people at the celebration. It was crazy. Um, and we realized how really important that is. So we had the girls create videos of their projects and then also demonstrate them at that day so that they could be a part, so that the IT part could also be a part of the celebration that they were doing where they do their dance performances and other things. Um, it's called Eureka-thon. Seriously, if you ever get invited to Eureka-thon, I highly recommend you bring earplugs because there's nothing like 60, 11 to 14 year old girls <laughs> screaming their heads off um, <laughs> to, to put you into a mood. Um, so let me show you an example of one of these videos. Actually, I'm gonna show you two of them. from a physics and sort of civil, civil engineering standpoint to figure out how to drop this thing and then crank it back up. It actually gets cranked up and dropped. Um, and they're, we're watching and their high school student mentors said, I don't think that can happen, right? They hadn't quite gotten to that part in their science education yet and they didn't think it was possible. And the middle school girls were fearless. They were like, we really want to do the terror, Tower of Terror. It's got to happen, it's got to happen. Um, and they just did it. And so it was a really exciting thing for us to see that just because they wanted to create this, they not only did some kind of complex programming stuff, but they did some really complex science that we had not taught them at all. Um, here's another example of one. <laughs> so uh, Six Flags is a pretty popular theme. Um, they, they always do one really fun field trip each year for Girls Inc. and Six Flags is the one they had done that year. So about half the projects were Six Flags related in some, one way or another. Um, but I want to show you guys this one because also you had the opportunity to create music through the software. Um, and that was one of the things we saw them do a lot. We actually saw one group that made, um, they made Hippie World and they composed Hey Jude using these sort of strange little um, not a way anyone should ever compose music, but they made it work. Um, and so it was pretty fun to see the way they were incorporating the sound effects and different things along with the other parts. Yeah. How long did they have for each one of these projects? Um, so what they did is that we had each student, any individual student was in, the, in our classes for about eight hours, um, spread across the four weeks. And the first uh, two weeks, they did all canned projects. So we had them sort of following following along to make different things that were very specified. And then in the final two weeks in their groups of four, they were doing um, they were doing their own projects that they could create on their own. And really, the, the very last day, they were mostly sort of doing polishing touches and making their videos. So they did most of the stuff in about three hours of time. And that's actually the more common way you'll see Pico Cricket's workshops happen, is you won't usually see them spread out like this. You'll see like a day, you know, like a Girl Scout day or something. Um, so they did them pretty quickly. Okay, so we did do a bunch of surveys and interviews and so on. The highlights of which are, um, as we had hoped would happen, they did show a better understanding towards engineering, the girls did, a better attitude and higher enthusiasm and interest. And I won't go through the details of all of this, but just really quickly. So for example, understanding, um, you'll see basically higher is better um, <laughs> for, for what you care about. Um, understanding what programmers do and understanding what engineers do. They, they were somewhere around the middle on both of those when they started um, and, they, and they went up in terms of their self-perception. And we also heard comments during our interviews with you know, people saying, 
being pretty creative, like with programming, you want a certain thing and you have a certain thing in your head, but you have to make it and you have to figure out how do you make it. Um, and so talking about sort of this experimentation. Um, another one about engineers, civil engineers make sure it all works together and the foundation is strong and it doesn't fall over. Um, <laughs> this kind of thing happened a lot, right? If you didn't pay attention to your engineering, your Legos kind of plopped, especially when somebody put a big glob of Play-Doh on the top of your thing. Um, and then, you know, we heard things like, this course is not like the big engineering that adults do, but it's a step towards it. And that's exactly what we we're going for, is for them to see a pathway um, that could, they could imagine a world in which they could possibly be engineers. Um, here, you know, lower is better, right? If <laughs> engineering is hard, <laughs> you want them to disagree with that statement. This is on a, a five point scale, by the way. Um, programming is hard. Um, that actually didn't go the direction we necessarily wanted. Um, I know more than my friends about computers. You know, we were hoping for that kind of move where girls would start to feel really confident about what they could do. Um, and I'm good with computers. We saw, we saw some jumps there. Um, interest. In the beginning, especially whoever got, drew the software engineering um, button for the day was unhappy as a general rule. Um, so, you know, we would see things like engineering jobs are boring and you get pretty high scores on that. Um, but we saw big jumps in things like engineering is fun, um, computer, computer jobs are boring going down. In our interviews, we'd hear things like programming. I used to think it was all just HTML and stuff. I didn't really think there was programming for making things move and light up and stuff. It's, I think it's cool how you can do almost anything. Um, so you see the sort of creativity when we put people in front of a computer and we tell them, you know, make it say hello world. That's not a very compelling way to learn about computing. <laughs> um, so this is pretty fun. And then I thought engineering was like a lot of building and math. I didn't used to like it because it was math. Now it's fun. Engineering is a lot of things. It's not just math. Um, so you hear this aversion, particularly around girls, around middle school age. Some of it is sort of socially constructed and being cool in front of your friends and not liking math. Um, but math is the big, the big, word and that if we get them away from that as a, as a concept they got a little bit more excited um, and we also started to see that you know you have a you have a very different model here so here you see Gabby who's an undergrad at the time leaning over bending in you know, very very close um, kind of excited the girls are very excited and then the students saying well you know I don't like the computers at my school but I like this um, at school they should have this um, and I want to remind you back to the very beginning where a lot of schools still have that computer lab mentality about how you teach computing and we see that that's just not compelling um, at least for middle school girls <laughs> um, so we've continued some of this work thanks in part to the MDP program here at Cal IT2 um, and Garnet Hertz who um, did his PhD in film and media studies here and is now um, postdocing in informatics has been doing a lot of work on circuit bending. Has anybody ever heard of circuit bending? At least one person, two? Well, you don't count. <laughs> um, and so the idea of circuit bending is literally you're taking circuits and you're bending them so that you can do different things. And I am by no means an electrical engineer and there's a lot of electrical engineers in this room, so I'm gonna leave it at that and not try to explain it in any more depth. Um, but Garnet's had this idea about repurposing basically trash, broken toys and things like this so that you can make cool, fun, new things. Um, and actually hand modifying these sort of battery powered toys to create other things. Um, and the idea then is to instruct all these individuals who have no prior experience in any kind of electric, electrical work or engineering or computing in sort of the fundamentals of electronics. And it's been good for me anyway because I'm not great with the electronics but I like playing with them. Um, so Garnet's been teaching me a lot. Um, and here you can see Garnet with, with a couple of girls at one of our workshops over in Verano Place. And they've also created a sort of zine about toy hacking. Um, and it's in Spanish, English, and Chinese um, because that's the undergrads we have access to. Uh, if anyone would like to translate it into other languages, we welcome you. Please come. Um, and he's been putting on these workshops. Let me show you a video of his stuff. If I can get it to you. Can you see? Oh, huh. I don't exactly know what that's. Hey, so what did you do?
They get a, the little ones especially get a little shy from time to time, so, uh, okay. Um, so that is a little bit challenging sometimes. But, um, but what Garnet's been able to do is take very young kids, I mean kids that I wouldn't even try Pico Crickets with, um, as you saw there, as well as adults. I mean he does these workshops also with 50 year olds. Um, and take these things apart and create a musical instrument out of, you know, a bunch of toys, or in that case, you know, they're sort of doing something very basic of speeding up and slowing down um, the sound that was already coming out of the toy before. Um, and in the process of doing that, well, these little girls aren't soldering. We have the adults solder, but we have the little <laughs> girls actually say, these two things need to go together and an adult will come by and actually do the soldering. But they're actually thinking about how the circuitry needs to work in a very sort of trial and error way um, that we're finding is actually pretty useful and compelling for them and then they learn more about the electronics than you might think that they do when you go to try to teach them the more complex concept. Um, and if you haven't seen this picture yet, it's just fun. Um, this is our vision of what we want to happen if we can ever convince the NSF to buy us a taco truck. Um, this project's been called the Taco Truck. We came up with the name before we came up with the acronym, um, but it stands for Technology and Community Outreach. Um, and the idea is instead of a bookmobile that sort of drives around, that you could actually go to schools for after school programs, roll up, pop open your hood, um, and instead of you know where you might put the condiments, you've got all kinds of little electronic circuitry and people can make <laughs> projects. Um, and this is, this is our fantasy. Garnet also has some great animations where he turns the truck into a low rider. Um, but I will not try to do that. Um, but this is what we're, we're really looking at is, you know, we recognize that different schools and different after school programs don't necessarily have the capabilities to do these kinds of projects, but actually they're pretty cheap to run. We mostly buy our toys from Goodwill, um, except for when the university won't let us because they can't figure out how to buy used broken electronics. Um, this, this confuses someone in accounting, I don't know why. Um, and we can go around and do these things really low cost, have people bring their own broken toys or bring, um, it started actually with Garnet being obsessed with all of the McDonald's Happy Meal toys that like, his kids and other kids were having around and like, what are you gonna do with all this junk? You can create cool new things. Um, okay, good, I'm doing well on time, hooray. So, what's next? Um, you know, we, we believe that novel technologies can create these sort of custom learning environments for every student. This has been the holy grail, as Stu mentioned. Everybody's been talking about it. since when TVs came out, it was all TVs are going to revolutionize the way that, that education happens. And then computers came out, and computers were going to revolutionize the way that education happens, and all this. We actually aren't trying to revolutionize the way education happens, but we're hoping that novel technologies can do some of the things that teachers are working so hard to do now, and community groups are working so hard to do. Create these kind of custom learning environments. Um, and fortunately, <laughs> there's a lot of sort of well-intentioned fumbling in the same direction, whether it's commercial product companies creating classroom management systems, or people like us, or whoever trying to create these different technologies. So that's why we primarily work with teachers, work with community groups that have this kind of experience. Um, and since Cal IT2 is so into interdisciplinarity, I thought I would really try to highlight for you guys the importance of that. We couldn't do what we do without true partnerships with these community groups and with, with um, the educators that are out there in the world. Um, and you can see my little happy quote about uh, interdisciplinarity. Okay, um, special thanks to Cal IT2 and to Europe for making all of this happen as well as all of these lovely, very generous people that I have to thank every time I talk about stuff. Um, and a special thanks to the three people in the back row who are purposefully sitting as far from me as possible, um, who've been doing a lot of this work and will continue to do it as we go forward. So. Thank you.